I would start with the more general definition of speculation in the spot market, because that is what really matters ultimately for people who have to pay for gasoline, which depends on the spot price of oil more than the futures price. So there, the definition would be someone buying oil for storage with the intent of selling it at a higher price later. The distinction would be that if you didn't have any speculation, then everybody would buy oil for current consumption. That is, at the end of the quarter, that oil is being used up and it's gone. The distinguishing characteristic here would be someone buying oil without wanting to use it for consumption, wanting to store it instead, such that when the price of oil has gone up in the meantime, you can resell that oil at a higher price. Well, speculation has become a convenient scapegoat. Um, if you go back 20 years earlier, people would have blamed OPEC. Uh, OPEC is not as scary as it seemed, and so it doesn't make a good scapegoat. Uh, this is another uh, opportunity for blaming someone else on what is going on, and people like easy explanations because the world makes more sense. In addition, if you're a policymaker, it is good for you if you can blame a phenomenon or uh, if you can provide an explanation that you can do something about. If it's speculators, as a policymaker, you can regulate, you can do something, you can be active. If it has to do with the fact that the world economy is growing more than expected, then there's not much you can do about it. And so naturally you would look bad because you appear impotent. That's why one reason why people prefer to have something like speculation to be the explanation. Well, the first question is uh, what the role of financial speculation has been. Uh, my own research shows that financial speculation, which is a subcomponent of all speculation that's taken place, cannot have been an important player, because speculation overall was not an important player in the period between 2003 and 2008, when we saw a big surge in the price of oil. And so from that point of view, if it didn't play a big role, of course, it cannot have altered uh, anything. Um, in particular, even if it had existed, it wouldn't have changed fundamentals, at least not in the short run. One could imagine that maybe through financial speculation there's a price incentive for additional oil production down the road, but if there were such an incentive, it might take five years for us to actually see that additional oil production. And so in the time frame that we are talking about, there clearly is no change at all. What we saw in the period leading up to the middle of 2008 was a long period of unexpectedly high demand for crude oil, essentially driven by the global business cycle. The world was growing faster, in particular emerging Asia was growing faster, and that, given a fairly uh, inelastic supply, uh, drove up uh, the price of crude oil tremendously. What changed in the middle of 2008? Well, that was the time period when we were hit by the financial crisis. At that moment, right before the financial crisis uh, was official, People looked into the future and they started worrying about a very big recession, if not a Great Depression. Now, if you're a producer, what do you do in that case? Well, at that point, you say, wait a minute, do I want to order additional orders of copper for the production of electronic gadgets that might be done in six months, or do I stop ordering? Well, what people decided in China and everywhere else was to stop ordering. When you stop placing orders, then, of course, the demand for these goods may drop rather drastically, immediately, much more than the corresponding measures of real GDP, for example, would drop. And so that explains essentially why the economy came to a standstill globally, and not just in the oil market, but essentially in all industrial commodity markets. When, by the end of that year, it turned out that uh, perhaps through actions of policymakers or otherwise, people figured it wasn't going to be as bad, we saw a partial recovery. Only a partial recovery, but essentially prices came up about two-thirds of the way where they used to be before. And since then, we've pretty much been at that level. And you might explain this not because of a floor in prices, but simply because uh, things haven't improved more and we are in a waiting position right now, seeing what's going to happen next. And nobody knows whether it's going to go up or down. And that's essentially why the price has been pretty stable. Now, uh, in addition, uh, you asked, well, what does that mean for oil producers? Should they be happy because they can cover the marginal cost of producing an extra bell? And the answer is, well, yes, but that's almost by definition. Because if they were not happy, right, they would stop producing that extra barrel of oil if it's more expensive than, the, than what they can get by selling that oil. And so essentially within a couple of months, that extra production would be shut down. Or uh, if there were an opportunity for increasing oil production because there's oil on the margin to be produced cheaply, well, then of course they would do it. So from their point of view, whatever the price is, they will adjust to it. 
From the point of view of oil producers, well, by and large, their attitude would be that more is better. More income is better for most of us. Um, of course, we all know from painful experience that if we want more income, we may not get it, uh, because essentially the market argues that this is not what the, we should be paid. The same thing for OPEC. OPEC can get away with charging a high price if there is enough demand out there that they can push that uh, price level through. Uh, currently, they're certainly happy with the level of the price of oil they get because that is enough to uh, essentially cover their fiscal imbalances. But we saw how not too long ago the price had dropped very low. We pointed that out earlier, and there was nothing they could do about that, whether they wanted it or not. It was just the way it was because there was not enough demand. If you wanted to measure financial speculation narrowly, which loosely speaking means speculation by market participants in oil futures markets who are not ordinarily in those markets. So we're not talking about refiners or oil companies. We're talking about people who took an interest in this market, perhaps because of high returns. The only way to measure their activity is to use the original data, trade by trade data, available to the Commodity Futures and Training Commission in the United States. Those data are not publicly available, but if you happen to work for the CFTC, you have access to those data and you can judge what these guys did, which side of the market they took, and whether they might have influenced the price. Um, we have a pretty good idea, actually, of what happened, because people looked at that question and came back saying there's no convincing evidence that they were able to force up the price. So from that point of view, uh, it is not necessary to try to incorporate that kind of financial speculation into a model. If you were to incorporate it in a model, you have to be careful because there are two sides here. One is modeling the oil futures market, and the other is modeling the spot market. As the ordinary person, you would be concerned about the spot market, because that's what determines the price of gasoline. Now, these two markets in general are not independent. They're linked by arbitrage conditions. And so if you understand uh, what the activity of financial speculators is in the futures market, that would allow you to use an arbitrage condition to model how this spills over to the spot market. And again, that has been done without taking a stand on what exactly the fraction of financial speculators is. And we have a very good understanding that speculation has mattered historically. It has mattered in 1986, for example, with the collapse of the, the OPEC cartel. And people essentially said, we're not afraid of OPEC anymore. Why hold inventories to protect us from uh, what might happen, in, what bad things might happen in the future? Another good example was 79, when uh, due to fears about what Iran might do in the Persian Gulf, there was a run on all inventories, because at the same time people expected growth to be high, and so they were really concerned about the availability of future oil. The same thing happened in 1990 with the invasion of Kuwait, when people worried about an invasion of Saudi Arabia, or in 2002, as people anticipated the Iraq war. So we have all these episodes where speculation mattered. However, if you go to the most recent period, there is no convincing evidence, at least up to the uh, recent Libya episode, that speculation has mattered.